welcoming. I want to welcome to the Amram Scholar Series this morning, and uh, it's great to see you all out. And we've got a real treat, I believe, this morning. As a boy in Nashville, Tennessee, before I knew who or what <clears throat> was the President of the United States, I knew Einstein was Jewish and the greatest mind on the face of the earth. I grew up in a very proud Jewish household. How Jewish was Einstein? How did he think? He was our Jewish icon. How did he act in this world? Was there a consistency of his, of his theories? And was there a consistency as well in his principles in life? In this book inspired by the biographies that have been created called Jewish Lives out of Yale University's, Stephen Gimbel gives us Einstein, his space and times. It is a real gift. It is an easy read and it is very intriguing. Stephen Gimbel occupied the Edwin T. and Cynthia S. Johnson Chair for Distinguished Teaching in the Humanities at Gettysburg College where he is the, was the chair of the Department of Philosophy. He earned his PhD in philosophy from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, where he grew up. He also attended the University of Maryland, where he got his BA in physics and philosophy. He said, when I asked him how he got interested in Einstein, he said, what else was there for a Jewish physics nerd kid to do? He lives in Frederick with his wife. They have two children, and he has written us a great book. It is my real honor to present to you this morning, and I look forward to it as well, Steve, Dr. Stephen Gimbel. All yours. Well, thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> Everyone loves Einstein, but Jews, we really love Einstein. I talk a lot, when I talk to non-Jewish crowds, I always have to tell them, I say, look, if you're going to talk to Jews, you gotta understand that before too long, you're going to hear a certain sentence. You know he's Jewish. <laughs> it's a game I like to call Jewish Jeopardy, right? You're talking, there's a conversation, a name comes up, you gotta be the first one to ring in with, you know he's Jewish. But there's one person, one person we never, ever have to say, you know he's Jewish, and that is, Albert Einstein. So of all the famous Jews, right, we know the whole list, right? Of all the famous Jews, how is it that Einstein got to be super Jew? How is it that Einstein is the person who occupies this privileged place? Right now, I mean, it's certainly true that Einstein was a Zionist of a sort, and we can talk about that later, but he was a scientist who happened to be a Zionist, unlike, say, Chaim Weizmann, who was a Zionist who happened to be a scientist, right? So the question here is, what is it that makes Einstein this sort of preeminent icon, to use your word, of Judaism, especially when, for a large portion of his life, he denied completely his Jewish identity? Because <laughs> we have a physicist here, he's liable to take your phone apart. If you don't turn it off, sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's okay. My brother's an engineer, we need him to put it back together. So, Einstein grows up in a secular house. A house so secular, they sent him to Catholic school. Peter Schule, or St. Peter's Academy. And his father, who was a sort of typical German Jew at the time, was not only non-religious, but actively anti-religious. Saw the old ways as superstitions that needed to be superseded. And this was not unusual, right? Especially in Germany at the time, you know, modernism was something that was very firmly rooted in the Jewish community because Right? We see the advances of modernism as bringing rights, as bringing equality, as bringing opportunity to Jews. And so this modern point of view was seen as something you know, very healthy. And so 
he, like many at the time, you know, very much were moving away from any deep sense of Judaism. Now, Einstein is sent to a Catholic school. Now, it was mandatory at the time. It was a, a law that all schooling include a religious component. So he's at a Catholic school. What's he getting? He's getting lessons in the catechism. Right? And it's interesting, he, he doesn't mind it too much. He, he finds the historical Jesus interesting. He finds you know, the, the, the deep sense of care about the needy, right? something that he finds intriguing. But he is, in this school, the only Jewish kid. Now, if you are a child who's a little bit different, kind of smart, what's going to happen? You're going to get bullied, right? Yeah, that's okay, years of therapy. Right? The idea here is that Einstein is bullied. Now, it's interesting, in different accounts, he tells the story differently. Right? In some cases, it's just verbal. In other cases, it's physical that he gets beat up a little bit. Right? But there's one event in these, these uh, religious classes that he recalls. At one point, the priest who was teaching comes in with three large, heavy metal nails and says, these are the sorts of nails that were used to cru crucify Jesus our Lord and ceremoniously drops them on the table with a large clatter, at which point every eye in the classroom turns to Einstein. <laughs> so here he is. Right? At school, he's the Jewish kid. Right? At home, right, he's got a father who is deeply anti-religious. Now, Einstein had a personality. Right? I mean, those of us who have more than one child know this. Right? They come out... They are their own person. Yes, the household shapes them. Yes, you do something. But there is a core to those kids that just is who they are. Right? I've got, as the rabbi mentioned, I have two kids. Right? My daughter is the older. My son is younger. When each of them was, you know, say, about two years old, if I would put on a recording of a concert, right at the end of the record, there's the applause. My daughter, when she was two and the applause would come on, she'd clap along with the record. My son, when he was two, when the applause would start, he'd stand up and take a bow. <laughs> They're just different kids. Right? Einstein was like that. Einstein had a personality. It was just a core element of his essence that if you had power, if you had authority, his thumb was going for your eye. Right? He was just one who just did not brook authority well. And so here he is at school being made fun of for being the Jewish kid and at home distancing themselves completely from Judaism. So if you're going to rebel, here's a chance for two birds with one stone, right? What are you going to do? You're going to become Jewish, right? So at age nine, Einstein becomes a practicing, observant Jew. Now, his family, while they were secular, right, they heard about the religious education. This was a little too much for them, so they brought in a, a religious uncle to basically give him one-on-one -on -one Hebrew school. So at this point, he just latches on. Right? He begins to keep kosher, which is really hard in a German household where every meal features sausage. Right? He makes up little psalms to God that he sings to himself on the way into school. So at age nine, Einstein really becomes Jewish. And then he turns 10. Turns 10. What happens when he's 10? He's completely turned away from this Jewish worldview. Rejects it completely. What is it that turns Einstein away from his Judaism? The reading of Talmud. Not the writings of the ancient rabbis, but Max Talmud, who was a medical student who would come to have dinner with the family once a week. 
It was a standard uh, part of Jewish life in Germany at the time that once a week you would have a college student over for dinner because college students then, like now, were poor, were in need of a good home-cooked meal. So once a week, Max Talmud would come and have dinner with the Einsteins. Now, if you want to get in well with the parents, what do you do? You make nice to the kid. So what's he going to do? Well, it was all the rage at this point. There were these cheap paperback popular science books that were coming out. So he would spend a mark. He would pick up one of these little books. He would bring it home, right, while the dinner was being prepared or while the dishes were being cleared. He and young Albert would talk about the books, who would read them voraciously, right? And Einstein took these books, and they just changed his mind completely. The book that did the most for him, the book that really, really opened his mind, just blew his brain wide open, was a book on Euclidean geometry. Yeah, that's the reaction we usually get. <laughs> right? Think back to high school. Geometry. Yeah, exactly. That look, that is exactly the right look. Right? The idea is, what are you doing geometry? Okay, you don't just memorize the theorems. What did you have to do for those theorems? <laughs> proofs, right? There's a book of proofs. So let's think about what Euclid does here really quickly, right? Euclid is this amazing book, right? He begins with 30 definitions, right? What's a definition? It's just what we mean by certain words. So a point. What is a point? That which has no part, right? Sort of like his hairstyle, right? I'm getting there. Right? The idea here is, right, that's just what we mean by a point. Right? So these definitions have to be true because they are true by definition. Yes, they're definitions. He then gives us five axioms. And these are non-geometric but mathematical claims that have to be the case. So if I give him a certain number of apples, and I give her the same number of apples, then I give them each additional apples, but I give them the same number, they still have the same number of apples, right? Equals added to equals gives you equals. Has to be true. Right? From there, he then gives us five postulates. And these are specifically geometric propositions. Right? So if I have two points, can I draw a line segment connecting them? How far can I extend it in this direction? As far as you want. How far in this direction? As far as I want. If I have a point, can I draw a circle around it? How big? Big as you want. Right? If I have a line, oh, here's a good line. If I have a line, and I have a point, not on the line, how many lines through this point can I draw which are parallel to this line? One and only one, right? Now, suppose he says, why one? Why not three? I mean, what are we going to say to him, right? Either there's some you know, psychological issues, or he's just being cantankerous. We know how he gets, right? So the point is, these are propositions that have to be true. You just see them. They're self-evident. And from these self-evident truths, using nothing more than deductive logic, the logic that gives you absolute certainty in your conclusion, what do you generate? Theorems. Hundreds of these theorems that are complex, some of them counterintuitive, but they have to be true. They have to be true. It's absolute truth about the nature of the underlying space itself. And it's all derivable using nothing but the human brain. The human mind is capable by itself of devising all of these intricate truths about the nature of space. For Einstein, that was amazing. Then another thing happens. He gets sick. Not very sick, just Chicken soup sick, right? Kids get sick, right? And he's in bed. He's not feeling well. His father wants to cheer him up. What does he do? Shows him a compass. Now, for most of us, we remember the first time we saw a compass. Okay, great. What's next? For Einstein, this was life-changing, right? The compass, there's a needle that points north. And no matter how you orient the compass, that needle still points north. Where's the string? What's pulling it? What Einstein saw in that compass was that there are active in the universe 
invisible forces that cause actual observable effects. The universe is filled with invisible forces that cause effects that we see. Combine that with what he gets from geometry, the idea that the human mind is capable of deriving with absolute certainty the truths about the world itself. And what he gets is this picture that the universe is a well-organized structure, that there are laws governing that universe, and those laws are accessible to the human mind just by thinking rationally. Rational thought is the key to knowledge and wisdom. Now, this means that Einstein can take that part of his personality that we talked about and let it run completely amok. Anything that tells you how to think, that tells you what to think, is a threat to your humanity. And that includes government, that includes military, that includes organized religion. Sorry. We're disorganized. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> so the idea here is anything that tells you what to think has to be rejected. And so Einstein, at age 10, rejects his Jewish identity. Now you think, all right, he's 10, it's a phase, right? First you reject the identity, then they get the bad haircut, then they come home with the tattoo, but eventually they'll settle down, they'll marry a nice Jewish girl, and life will be fine. Right? Well, Einstein marries and shakes but that's a different story. <laughs> Einstein, this isn't just a phase. He maintains this antipathy towards organized religion. He maintains a position where he refuses to consider himself at all Jewish, well into his adult life. Now, 1905 comes, theory of relativity. We'll explain it in a minute. Let me put it on the table for now. Right? Ultimately, that leads to him becoming a famous physicist. He gets his first job. He's an assistant professor in Zurich. Now, these days, assistant professor is a rank. It's just a title that you have. In those days, you literally were the assistant to the professor. And Einstein wanted a full professorship. He wanted you know, to be the guy whose research really ran the show. And he finally gets his first offer. It's in Prague. Good university. OK. Packs the family up from Zurich. We're going to Prague. Got an option, an opportunity for this wonderful position. Gets to the border. Has to fill out some paperwork. You know, work visa, that sort of thing. Just bureaucratic stuff. So there's a form, he's filling it out, name, age, date of birth, background, gets to religion. He writes, dissenter. The bureaucrat looks at him and says, that's not a religion. You need to write a religion. You're Jewish. You have to put down Jewish. He says, I'm not and I won't. The bureaucrat says, you have to. He says, I refuse. The bureaucrat says, you must. He says, I shan't. <laughs> and so the bureaucrat then plays the one card he thinks he has. Well, if you don't write Jewish on that blank, you can't have the job. This is Einstein. You think you have authority? He says, fine and starts to walk out. He's going to give up what could be his only opportunity at a full professorship just so he doesn't have to write down that he's Jewish on a silly form that no one's going to see. That's how deeply he rejects Judaism. Now, at this point, the bureaucrat realizes he's this close to losing Albert Einstein for the country. This could be really bad for his job. And so he says, oh, okay, hang on, hang on. And they negotiate a settlement. They come to an agreement. On the form, they will write, mosaic. <laughs> but the point is that here is Einstein, as an adult, as a well-known physicist, who 
to such a degree rejects any sense of Jewish identity that he won't even write it on a silly form in order to get his dream job. And yet, within the next five years, he will find himself back in Germany addressing Jewish groups using the pronouns we and us. Einstein, in those subsequent years, readopts a Jewish identity. How does that happen? That's the central question that I asked in this book. What is it that made Einstein change his mind and decide to reassert in his own mind his Jewish identity? And the answer is two things. The first was the reception that his theory of relativity got in Germany. Okay, I promised you relativity, here's the point. Okay, trust me, you will understand this. Okay, I come from Baltimore, I gave a talk like this in the, the Pikesville Library where I grew up. My grandmother was there, 93 years old. If Grandma Fran could understand it, trust me, you'll be fine. <laughs> Two simple concepts I need you to understand. One is what we call covariance. Okay, simple question. Is the pen to the left or right of my hand? And you will say, oh, will you stop it? <laughs> Should know better than to ask a question to a room full of Jews and expect an answer. Simple question. If I ask you, is the pen to the left or right of the hand? You will say, to the left. I will say, to the right. Well, if you say left and I say right, we disagree which one of us is right. Both of us. So it, it doesn't matter. It's whatever you want. Right? So if she says, I think the pen is to the right, think of her. Yeah, left is the one, not the L. Right? The fact is, from where you're sitting, there is a fact of the matter. From where you're sitting, the pen is to the left of the hand. From where I am standing, the pen is to the right of the hand. This is what we call a covariant truth. That is, there is a fact of the matter once you nail down a reference frame. Once you have a point of view, there will be a fact. But that fact can change with your reference frame. Covariant varies with. Now, suppose I ask you, is the pen between my hands? Yeah, and that's true no matter how you look at it. That's an invariant truth. Covariant, there is a truth, but that truth depends upon where you're sitting. Invariant truth, that truth is the case no matter where you look. Now, we think invariant truths are really important. We think that an invariant truth means that it's true of the underlying universe itself. Right? Now, I mean, think about this. Right? Suppose she tells me something. Am I going to believe it? We know how she is, right? <laughs> but now suppose she tells me too. And I know they're not talking after, you know, that thing at the Seder this year. It's been ugly, right? So I know they're not talking and they both say the same thing. And then he tells me, and I know he doesn't even know those two. And then he tells me. Now suddenly I'm starting to think, must be something to this, right? Either that or they saw it on Facebook. Right, so the idea here is, if it's an invariant truth, if it's true regardless of your perspective, that probably means that it's true of the underlying reality itself. So we like invariant truths. Now, in physics, the theory that we had before Einstein, the theory of uh, mechanics that came from Isaac Newton, said there were a few invariants in reality, right? How long would you say that pen is? Five inches. So if it's five inches now, how long is it now? It should be five inches, just five inches moving, right? No. What Einstein says is that if I'm moving at three quarters the speed of light across the floor, you would measure this five inch pen as three inches. I, who am in the same reference frame, will still measure it as five inches. Well, which is it? Is it five inches or is it three inches? Is it to the left or to the right? Length, it turns out, is not an invariant. It's a covariant. That is, 
length changes with your reference frame. And it's not only length, right? If we synchronize our watches, I love this. In younger audiences, I go to synchronize, they all pull out their phones. So if we synchronize our watches, so one second on his watch, one second on my watch. If our watches are synchronized now, they should be synchronized whether I'm still or moving or in the opening scene to West Side Story. Right? The point is that time is time. Right? No. What Einstein says is that if I'm moving at three quarters the speed of light across this floor, you will hear my watch. Slow down. Now, to me, so which one of us is right? Is my watch running slow or isn't it? Turns out that time is a covariant property. That how fast time passes is a function of your reference frame. And it's not just length or time. It's actually mass. The faster you go, the heavier you get which is not reason to tell your doctor you're not going to work out on the treadmill, right? This is why nothing can go faster than the speed of light. It's not an engineering problem. It's not that we haven't figured out how nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Here's how I'll explain it in the classroom. I'll take a chair and I'll push it and it'll slide across the floor and I'll say to my students, okay, what just happened? I say, well, you exerted a force and it accelerated. Exactly. Right? So I say, what happens if we add more mass? And I'll take a, a slight young lady, I'll put her in the chair. I'll say, okay, if I want the same acceleration, what do I need? More force. And I'll slide her across the floor. And then we bring the chair back. I say, okay, let's add more mass. And I'll take a, a husky gentleman, usually a football player, and I'll sit him right on her lap. And I say, okay, if I want the same acceleration, what do I need? Even more force. And I'm not going to do that because I'll get a hernia. But the point is, right, as I increase the mass, what do I need to get the acceleration? More force. What Einstein says is as your speed approaches the speed of light, the mass approaches infinity. Now, if I had an infinite mass in here, how much force would I need to accelerate it even a tiny bit? An infinite amount of force, which requires an infinite amount of energy, you ain't going to get that. That's why nothing can go faster than the speed of light. It's just in the structure of the world because things increase their mass as they go faster. To show you how much of a nerd I was back in college, we took my buddy's car and we attached a digital meter to a speedometer and programmed it to show how much heavier the car would be if measured by someone on the side of the road based upon the speed he was driving. And we clearly had plenty of time to do this because none of us could get dates. <laughs> it's okay, I'm married now. She's stuck. So the point is, right, that things like length, time, mass, things that we thought were facts about the nature of the world itself, things that we thought were invariant truths, part of the furniture of the universe, turn out just to be functions of our perspective. Now, is everything relative in the theory of relativity? No. There is a very important invariant. And it wasn't Einstein who figured this out. It was actually Einstein's old college professor, a man named Hermann Minkowski, who was a uh, Russian Jew whose family moved to Königsberg. He ended up teaching at the university where Einstein occasionally went to class. Einstein, again, you know, this, this personality quirk he has, right? Uh, Minkowski is responsible for the myth we had that Einstein was a bad student. You hear, well, Einstein failed math. Einstein did not fail math. How do we know? We have two pieces of evidence. One, we have his report cards. Einstein was getting the highest marks in mathematics. 
The second piece of evidence, we have letters from his mother to his grandmother while he's growing up. Now, you're a Jewish mother whose son is doing very well in mathematics. What are you doing? You're excelling. You're bragging. And that's what she's doing. So we know Albert Einstein actually did very well in mathematics. He gets to college. Yeah. He was at a university where the head of the physics department thought classical physics is what people needed to learn. Einstein thought, no, if I'm going to learn physics, I need to learn what the physicists are doing now. And so he thought class was just useless. So he would go to a coffee house with some friends. He'd read the latest journals. He'd talk about cutting edge physics. And so his physics professors did not think much of him. Minkowski was one of them. Minkowski was one of the first people to realize how important the theory of relativity was. When the paper on relativity theory first comes out, Minkowski reads it and is blown away. He looks and says, oh, isn't this funny? There must be some other physicist named Albert Einstein. No. And so Minkowski starts saying things to just sort of needle his former student. He would say things like, well, Einstein doesn't know math, and I know because I taught him. Right? Now, the thing to understand is Minkowski, while he taught physics, he was teaching mathematical physics because, by trade, he was a mathematician. Now, most people look at, you know, people in my line of work, it's like, okay, they're nerds. Turns out if you do close anthropological work, there are very different species of nerds. <laughs> Physicists and mathematicians may look alike to the untrained eye. Very different groups. See. Physicists look at the mathematicians, and they think, oh, they're these weirdos playing with these imaginary universes while we're over here discovering the actual laws that govern the universe. The mathematicians are saying, yeah, they're only doing that because they can't do real math. And so there's this odd sort of disconnect. And the physicists think they're high and mighty until such time as their search for the immutable laws of the universe I mean they realize they don't have enough math. And so they have to walk over to their friends in the math department and ask, can you teach me this? And the mathematicians very haughtily will say, maybe, I'm not sure if you're smart enough. But then, you know, the physicist buys lunch and off we go. So Minkowski was a mathematician. He's making fun of a physicist in exactly the way they usually do. He writes a paper in 1909 called Space and Time. And in that paper, what he does is show Einstein the real meaning of Einstein's own theory. And at first, Einstein reads the paper and he's just enraged. He thinks, oh, here's Minkowski. All he's doing is trying to make me look stupid again. All he's doing is just putting the, this, this common sense theory in a way that nobody will understand. He thought the theory was common sense. But ultimately, he realizes what Minkowski is doing is something really important. He's showing that there is a crucial invariant. It's what we call the space-time interval. It's a four-dimensional measure. Okay, time out. He said four-dimensional. He's a philosopher. Is this where we're getting new agey? No. Okay. When I say the word dimension, all I mean is the number of numbers needed to uniquely specify a location. Right? So, a house. Your address. How many numbers? One. Right? All I need is one number to know how far down your street to go to get to your house. If you're in Manhattan, now how many numbers do you need? You need two, right? You need the street and the avenue. But then you're going to need a third number, the one to push in the elevator. One, two, three, a three-dimensional space. But if you have a job interview, and for younger audiences, I often have to explain what that means, right? Now you need a fourth, right? I need four numbers to uniquely specify an event, right? How do I differentiate between those? Pretend those were good snaps. How do I differentiate between those two snaps? Well, one, two, three will get me to the place. They happen in the same place. I need a fourth number. I need the time. So when we say time is the fourth dimension, that's all we mean. To uniquely specify the occurrence of an event, I need four numbers. Right? So if time is the fourth dimension, what's the fifth dimension? Yeah, it's an old singing group from the 1960s. Right? So what Minkowski points out 
if I take those two snaps, there's a distance between them and a time between them, right? If a person is in motion, that distance will shrink and the time will stretch. But he points out that if we combine them in just the right way, it turns out that the four-dimensional distance between those two will be the same for everybody. It will become an invariant. And remember what we mean by an invariant. It's something which is true of the underlying universe. So if the invariant is a four-dimensional measure, that must mean that the universe itself is four-dimensional. But we don't see four dimensions. We live in three dimensions and one-dimensional time. right? But the ultimate reality, Minkowski points out, is this fourth dimension. And Einstein realizes that and runs with it. That had an effect. People looked at that and said, four-dimensional universe? There he goes again. Einstein, trying to take physics, the nature of the universe itself, and make it baffling, make it confusing, typical of a Jew. And there were a group of physicists between the world wars who referred to Einstein's work as Jewish science in an attempt to denigrate it as opposed to real science, authentic science, Aryan science, right? Science that makes sense of the world. No. What do those Jews do in the marketplace, right? They're fast talkers. You walk away, you think you got a deal, and then halfway home you realize, oh, you've been bamboozled, right? Now they're doing it in science too. And so Einstein, with his theory of relativity, is labeled, in the harshest sense, a Jew. Now, Einstein was not just a scientist. He was political, very political. Political at a time in a way that was not popular. World War I in Germany was supposed to be a watershed event. It was supposed to be the thing that led to German hegemony. It was going to be the thing that placed Germany as the great power in all of Europe. And almost all of Germany was united behind the Kaiser in support of the war. Left, right, center, everybody supported the war, except for a few voices like Einstein. Now, not to give it away, if you haven't read the book yet, not to give it away, but the war doesn't go well for Germany. <laughs> the sequel doesn't turn out well for them either. But in the end of the war, right, there is this intense split. Right? There are those on the left who are internationalists. Right? who say science provides us the way forward. And there were those on the right who say, no, right? it's the old ways. If we lost the war, and I'm not saying we lost the war, right? because how do you lose a war? You lose a war when somebody else invades and takes over. No one occupied the fatherland until the Weimar government, which included Jews, allowed them in. So we didn't lose the war. But if we lost the war, and I'm not saying we did, but if we did lose the war, it's because of them the communists, the socialists, and the liberals. And in those days, those were three different groups. Right. So the idea is, here's Einstein, the poster child of the Weimar government, the poster child of this internationalist pro-scientific worldview that they see as having stabbed the culture in the back. And Einstein... As much as he was hated by them, and he was hated by them, hated them too. Now, we all know what happens. The economy collapses. Everybody needs money. And this includes Einstein. Now, you need money. You have some little bit of fame. What do you do? You give lectures. You go on, may I borrow it, Absolutely. a very nice book tour with reasonably priced volumes available after the talk. And so what does Einstein do? He goes on a talk tour. He goes, and where does he go? Well, following the advice of the great American philosopher Willie Sutton, where the money is. And where's the money? The United States, Great Britain, and France. He goes to those countries that are the enemy. And so here's Einstein palling around with the people who killed our brave sons, being celebrated as the new German, the rehabilitated German, 
All why? For self-aggrandizement and self-enrichment. Typical of a self-serving Jew. And Einstein was hated. Hated. Think Jane Fonda during Vietnam. That's the level of hatred they had for Einstein. And here he was being taken seriously politically. Why? That theory. That darn theory. If we got rid of that theory, we get rid of Einstein's political power. And so Einstein was attacked for being a Jew. Now, Einstein thought, okay, either I can let the anti-Semites tell me who I am, or I can claim it myself. At the same time, he has a second realization. And that realization is that when he's with his Jewish friends, now Einstein has lots of friends. This is Einstein. Everyone wants to be Einstein's friend, right? But he notices, even though he loves all of them, that when he's with his Jewish friends, whether they are explicitly Jewish or a lot of his friends were Jewish but had converted, there was just a fundamental felt difference in the relationships he had with his Jewish friends. There was a way of being, a way of talking. There were jokes they could tell. There was just something fundamentally different about his relationships to his fellow Jews. Now, at the same time, there was an influx in Germany of refugees from the East, fleeing horrible, horrible pogroms, horrible war, horrible conditions. Sadly, some things seem never to change. And he saw these Eastern European Jews hungry to better their lives, and he saw what was happening to them in Russia, in Lithuania, in Poland, and especially in Ukraine, which he referred to as a hell. And he said, we need to help these people. And in their suffering, he starts referring to them as his kinsmen. And so in the suffering of the immigrants, in his relationships with his fellow Jews, and in the treatment he's getting from the anti-Semites, he realizes that try as he might, he can't distance himself from his Jewish identity. And so that, in the end, is how Albert Einstein becomes possibly the world's first born-again Jew. <laughs> and with that, I think we have a quick uh, commercial. Super. Thank you so much. Remarkable. I didn't realize as I read this book that I read his other book previously. I rushed up to my study late uh, last night to see because I wanted to compare these two different books on Einstein that I read and see how the theories were explained because this seemed to be a much clearer way than the other. And then I realized they were from the same author. But uh, uh, you have a remarkable and a, a great gift be wonderful to sit in those classes in Gettysburg. Um, we'll uh, continue, and in a moment we're going to pass out cards uh, for our questions, and we'll start with those, but I'd like to call upon uh, Leslie Maitland to share with you our uh, next um, AMRAM Scholar speaker, and to thank her for all that she has done in creating this incredible opportunity that we have in our AMRAM Scholar Series. Uh, Leslie travels to New York. She hears many of the speakers and gives us firsthand accounts. And then it is through her great research that we're able to pick these wonderful speakers. Leslie, please. Well, uh, really, thank you all for coming and. Thank you, Professor Gimbel, for confirming another theory of time, which is that time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I wish that uh, I could say that always hearing the snippet of a lecture it confirms that the, the full performance will be fantastic, but I think we better have you back uh, again and again because this was really, really great. Um, but I just want to tell you about a few other upcoming programs we have. I'll give you the next four. And we have these beautiful leaflets out there on the table that um, can uh, 
can't help you remember them, but uh, on January 31st, we have a very interesting speaker called Shulem Dean. This is a, uh, a young man, a journalist, who grew up in an extremely restrictive Hasidic community in New York State, really cut off from the world, not permitted to view television, to listen to the radio, to really even to learn English, married by the age of 18, five children by the time he was 23. When he ventured to turn on a radio one day, it changed the world. He began to explore reality, wound up excommunicated from home, family, divorced, hasn't seen his children in 10 years. He, he lost his faith, he lost his world, and, uh, but of course he gained uh, the modern age. And um, it's an amazing story that he tells. So that'll be on January 31st. And the uh, February 21st, we have Sarah Wildman, again a journalist. She did a personal memoir searching into the story of her grandfather's escape from Europe before the Holocaust and the story of the girl that, his grandfather, that her grandfather left behind. On uh, March 13th, we have Bruce Hoffman. Bruce Hoffman is uh, director of the Center for Security Studies at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at the U.S. Military Academy's Combating Terrorism Center, who talks about the terrorism involved in winning the State of Israel, you know, defeating the British, and winning independence. And uh, lastly in March, we have Roberta Kaplan, who is the litigator who won the landmark case that defeated the Defense of Marriage Act in the Supreme Court. So join us for those, and we'll have more coming up in the spring, but we hope we'll see you for those other winter programs and uh, give you back to Professor Gimbel to talk about Einstein and policy. Thank you. You're up. <clears throat> so I'd, I'd like you to first, as the questions, are there, do people get cards and put in it? No, oh, all right, the cards are going around, I'll start. So I, I'm interested if you could, uh, you briefly touched on, you know in the book you talk about um, Einstein's relationship to Zionism, which becomes, in your mark, sort of a, uh, a necessary evil in, in that sense to a degree. Will you talk a little bit about how that relationship to Zionism begins to develop and what happens in that respect? Sure. It's a complicated relationship. See, Einstein, as we mentioned earlier, has an inherent problem with the notion of a nation state. He thinks patriotism is a social ill. Patriotism is a, an illness of the human soul, that what it does is wrongly divide us. And so while Einstein is, labels himself a Zionist, his picture of Zionism is very different from you know, that of, say, Weizmann. He does not believe that there ought to be a Jewish state, in part because he doesn't believe there ought to be states. He thinks that if it becomes about land, that it will chip away at the heart of Judaism itself. Now, he, at this point, is actually having dinner regularly with his friend Martin Buber, with whom he disagrees about virtually everything except their picture of Zionism, which is what we would now call a one-state solution. Mm -hmm. That is, there ought to be, in Palestine, a safe haven for Jews to flee oppression anywhere in the world. Now, what Einstein thinks is crucial there is Hebrew University. Einstein sees what he thinks is a sickness of the soul in European Jews. He has a number of friends uh, who have converted. And he thinks, you know, it's just a cynical act. They will never accept you as authentic Jews. I rather, as authentic Germans. They will always see you as the other. He says, the problem with these people is that they're unwilling to really embrace their Judaism. He says, the people who taught him how to be Jewish were American Jews. When he would come to America, and he came here a couple of times to raise money for Zionist causes, primarily Hebrew University, he saw in American Jews an unbifurcated self, that American Jews felt American and felt Jewish and felt no conflict between them. 
He said, in Europe, there's just, there is a sort of uh, a Stockholm syndrome that's taken effect. That is, that the anti-Semitism is so deep that the Jews themselves have internalized it and do think themselves inferior. They said, what we need is a beacon to the world. And he thought that Hebrew University would be that light. What you would do is get the greatest Jewish minds from all over the world, bring them together, and what would happen would be these great advances in science, these great advances in technology, these great advances in the arts, in the humanities, and these would then go out to the world, and Jews all over could look and say, see, we did that. And there would be this sense of pride. And so for Einstein, the establishment not of a Jewish homeland, but of a Jewish university, was going to be the key to reclaiming Jewish identity worldwide. He didn't want it to be about land. He wanted it to be about pride. Now, the, you know, the Zionists of the time were very keen to use Einstein's name, which could raise a lot of money. Einstein knew what was happening. He referred to himself as a prized ox that would get trotted out. But he believed so much in Hebrew University that he was willing to do it. And while he was on his trips to America, he would take side trips where he would give his own talks and raise money for his family. And so Einstein you know, was not in any conventional sense a Zionist. Well, it's the, I, I'm going to ask you if you actually would share the quote that you do, which I think is fascinating. If you'd read this particular quote, your one in the context, because I believe what you're, the, the great struggle that you talk about and so beautifully do is so germane. And the struggle that, I mean, my next question will be to wander into the area of his pacifism. But just if you would share that, because it's incredibly insightful what you found. The sure, here are the words. The first and most important necessity is the creation of a modus vivendi with the Arab people. Friction is perhaps inevitable, but its evil consequences must be overcome by organized cooperation so that the inflammable material may not be piled up to the point of danger. The absence of contact in everyday life is bound to produce an atmosphere of mutual fear and distrust, which is favorable to such lamentable outbursts of passion as we have witnessed. We Jews must show, above all, that our own history of suffering has given us sufficient understanding and psychological insight to know how to cope with this problem of psychology and organization, the more so as no irreconcilable differences stand in the way of peace between Jews and Arabs in Palestine. Let us, therefore, above all, be on our guard against blind chauvinism of any kind, and let us not imagine that reason and common sense can be replaced with British bayonets. Now, now we recognize we recognize that any quote is, I would guess, I say, a covariant yeah. and not an invariant. Um, be, but um, it, it's fascinating, and you go on in a beautiful way to talk about the great struggles between Weitzman and uh, and Einstein over the issues of what the nature of Hebrew University should yeah. be in itself. Um, but would you also go on and talk a little bit about um, how that the role of pacifism rolls in? And what I want to ask you on both of these is, is do you believe, having looked at all this research, now studied both Einstein's, um, Einstein's, when your first book, when you write, or the first book I read of yours, the uh, claiming, you know, the Jewishness of Einstein's science, in a sense, and you've apocopated that in this book in talking about this. Do you believe these elements were consistent in Einstein, or do they, like his own theories, develop and are they redacted in the relativity that you mentioned in the beginning? It's a good question. So Einstein was a pacifist. Einstein grew up in an adolescent Germany. The country was only a country for eight years before Einstein was born. And countries are kind of like love affairs. They start out very hot and fiery and passionate, right? And in the case of a nation, that's patriotism. Now, the Germany that Einstein grew up in, there were regular military parades that would happen down the streets. And militarism was seen as a core element to German identity. And so Einstein from a very young age, 
acquires just a deep distaste to anything martial. And that's a sense that only stays with him and deepens as he matures. He becomes a pacifist. He thinks that warfare as a, an element of foreign policy is inherently immoral. <coughs> he argues you know, at one point that if 2%, and it's unclear where the calculation for this came from, that if 2% of conscripts would refuse to serve, that it would bring down the entire military complex. He urges an end to war intellectually and morally. Now, in the case of Zionism, right, he sees violence happening between Palestinians and Jewish settlers. And he thinks that if only we do it in the right way, there could be coexistence, there could be cooperation. Right? Weizmann is arguing with him, saying, well, who do we negotiate with? Where is our partner for peace? Right? And you can hear you know, echoes of phrases that to this day continue. Is it naive? Maybe. Is it more complicated than that? Of course. But you know, when you look at what he says in certain ways, certain things have turned out, it certainly seems that you know, his warnings were prescient. Well, was this in a sense, and I'm, and I'm going to ask you to move this into the question about pacifism, was this in a sense um, the functional side of him in, in that sense that he only engaged in Zionism because of the relative space in history and time that he occupied and what was happening both in his own life in the shutting down of all Jewish intellectualism and the becoming this other if you see and uh, he only saw that that nationalism in that sense was the only avenue out um, what you write in a sense reminds me of the the, the writings of Leo Pensker who you know to, writes the auto emancipation and talks about that it's not until we have this self-determination and we define ourselves that we'll be able to. So I think that's fair. I mean, okay. I think you know, Einstein was writing at a time of virulent anti-Semitism. And I, you know, I think in Einstein's own mind, life would be better if everyone could simply be who they were, where they were. Mm -hmm. That the need for this safe haven was an unfortunate side effect of the social ill of nationalism. And that if we could get rid of that root cause, that a safe haven in Palestine would be unnecessary, but that it was only sadly necessary, reluctantly necessary, given that Eastern European Jews, Western European Jews, you know, Middle Eastern Jews were under attack, and that if we could, as he you know, so deeply wanted to, if we could just erase these national boundaries, if we could erase these you know, harmful senses of self-identification that separate people from people. Right? He looked at science. Science, in his worldview, is not only something that gives us insight into the nature of reality itself. It provides a model right, of interpersonal right. relationships. Right? It's only in science at that time that a French physicist, a German physicist, an American physicist could sit down, cooperate, work off of each other's work, could accept what each one is doing. He saw science as this model of internationalism, of moving beyond you know, the petty artificial boundaries that had been drawn. And I think you're right. He had hoped that that... He he did, possible, he did that, but you, sh you prove so beautifully that all of those things as a principle and axiom didn't play out in his own life at all. No. Because those, the, those other realities came far too. But what you also show, I believe, is the, his incredible consistency with those principles. So will you talk a little bit about his, his foray into pacif pacifism uh, and his, you know, his uh, both the the necessity he believed of uh, the end of war and his reaction to both the Manha his involvement and reaction to the Manhattan Project. So Einstein is not only a, an intellectual pacifist; he's an activist pacifist. At one point, he joins a resistance group that is smuggling pacifist literature, food, and other things into prisons. Uh, where pacifists who have been 
arrested for being conscientious objectors are being held, right? Uh, he becomes a spokesman for a number of international causes, and so he is deeply connected with anti-war movements. That being said, there were two episodes where he finds himself strangely on the side of the war. One is there were two pacifists in Belgium who were urging people not to join the Belgian army just as Hitler's troops were amassing on the border. Now, in World War I, German uh, troops had invaded and done horrible things in Belgium. The Belgian king and queen were panicked that this was about to happen again because Germany had only gotten worse. And here looked like there could be an uprising that could undermine Belgium's ability to defend itself. And so the king personally writes to Einstein, asking him not to intervene on behalf of these two pacifists. In fact, urging him to do the opposite, asking people to rise to the defense of the nation. Now, when Hitler came to power in 1933, Einstein was in Pasadena, California. He had to go back to Europe to get some affairs in order. He couldn't go back to Germany, so he ended up in Belgium, where he did his necessary tasks, and there he became good friends with the royal family. So he angered many pacifists in saying that, I do not believe in offensive war, but if there is a chance that innocent civilians could be slaughtered, sometimes you need to do what you need to do to defend a nation. So that it isn't war, really, it's just a defensive posture. Then he moves to America, ends up first again in California for a little bit, ultimately ends up at uh, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Takes a vacation, goes to Long Island, rents a house from a doctor. Right? Now, his theory of relativity gave us the iconic equation, E equals mc squared. Okay, what does that mean? Energy equals mass times the square of the speed of light. Okay, what is that? Most important part of that equation? It's the part most people ignore, the equal sign, exactly. What does equals mean? It's the same as, it's the same as. Energy is the same as mass. Mass is energy, that's weird, right? I mean, energy, we've known that energy comes in lots of different forms, right? So energy, you know, heat. Heat can be turned into you know, if you heat something up, I could cause chemical changes in the food. I could eat the food. It can give rise to right, kinetic energy, the energy of motion. Energy of motion can turn a turbine, which gives rise to electricity. Right? That electricity can create light. Energy can be changed from form to form to form. Right? We've known all about energy. Mass is a different th that sort of thing. Mass is just stuff. Right? I can give the mass energy. Right? But energy is different from mass. What Einstein showed in this theory of relativity is that mass is just another form of energy. Whoa. And not only is it just a little, another form of energy, but the amount of energy is equal to the mass times the square of the speed of light. Now, the speed of light is fast, really fast. So it's a big number. A big number squared, really big number. Okay, so if you add even a teeny little bit of mass times a really big number, you get a big number. So if I could take even a tiny bit of mass and extract the energy from it, you get a huge amount of energy. That could be amazing. If we could free up that much energy, we could run the lights, we could do everything. Or if we had ill will, we could use it as a really nasty weapon. Now. No one was really worried about this because, yeah, theoretically it was possible. We hadn't figured out how to do it. Otto Hahn had shown that it happened in some weird sort of situation, but it wasn't technologically feasible. No one believed it. And then a physicist, a friend of Einstein's named Leo Szilard, a Hungarian physicist, was driving in London, which meant he was stuck in traffic. <laughs> He's stuck in traffic. And he's looking around, waiting, and all of a sudden it hits him. He understands how to do it. 
He knows how to take E equals MC squared and actually turn it into a usable technology, uranium. If I take uranium, uranium is a really big atom. And when it breaks apart, it gives off three neutrons, which are speeding very fast. That's where the energy goes. Well, if you have that uranium packed together, those three neutrons will be bullets. And each one will hit another uranium atom, which will then break apart, giving off three, which give off three, which give off three. Right? You remember that old commercial, you tell two friends, you tell two friends, you tell two friends. Oh, my goodness. This could be really bad. This was during World War II. If the Germans figured this out, and we knew Werner Heisenberg, one of the great geniuses of the period, was working with the government, this could be really bad. So when he comes to America, he had to come on a visit. He was at Princeton. He goes to tell Einstein, goes to his office. Einstein's on Long Island. Where is he? His secretary doesn't have the address. The secretary just has the name of the doctor whose house he's renting for a week. All right. That's minus one dimension. Yes. <laughs> so he gets a friend of his to drive him out to Long Island. They're asking everybody they can find where this doctor's house is. Nobody knows the doctor. Okay? It's a summer home. Who's going to know the guy? Suddenly they realize they're asking the wrong question. There's a boy walking down the street. They say, excuse me, where's Dr. Einstein staying? Oh, let me take you there. <laughs> so they go, and they see Einstein. I you know, knock on the door, unannounced. Einstein opens it up. Oh, my goodness, there are two of his friends. Come on in. Gives them some iced tea. They sit on the porch. Say, we have a problem. And he tells them what he realized, that uranium is the key to nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Now... Where is uranium? Think back just a decade. Yellow cake? You remember that term? In the Congo, which was at one time a colony of Belgium. Isn't it interesting how Belgium gets tied into all of this? We need to get in touch with the Belgian government and tell them not to sell uranium to the Germans. Who do we know who can get in touch with the Belgian king and queen? Oh, Einstein's a friend, so they go and find Einstein. So they're coming up with a plan to figure out how to get to the Belgian king and queen. This is in the middle of a war. Two foreign nationals contacting a head of state about matters of war. This probably looks bad. So they decide, we'll go through the US government. Who do we know in the government? So they're thinking. Einstein says, ah, you know who I met at an event one time is Lindbergh. Not a good choice. They realize how funny that is. This is a great thing. If I'm in a non-Jewish audience, that line is not funny. <laughs> yes, OK. What do we do? What do we do? They don't go to Lindbergh, but one of them realizes he knows Alexander Sachs of Goldman Sachs, who was a close friend of Roosevelt, will get a letter to him. And when that decision is made, they decide, instead of just trying to tell the Belgians not to sell uranium, maybe, because this is such a threat, maybe we need to do it before the Germans. And so they decide they will get together again in one week. They will write the letter. Well, this time, Eugene Wigner, who was the physicist whose car they used. He was out in California giving a talk. So another Hungarian physicist, a man named Edward Teller, a young physicist, had a car. So Teller drove Zillard out to Einstein. Einstein dictated the letter in German, the language he was most comfortable in, <laughs> to Teller, who translated it into English, and it was written down by Zillard. They wrote two versions, a long version and a short version. They decided to send the short version. They gave it to uh, Sachs, and he ultimately took it to Roosevelt. He said he was not going to deliver it until he had a personal audience, and he read it. And that was, and they were considering the possibility previously of a nuclear uh, program, 
but it was that letter that was sort of the last straw, and that's what gave rise to the Manhattan Project out of fear that the Germans would get there first. Now, of course, we know the Germans didn't get there first. When the bombs were dropped on Japan, Einstein felt deep, deep regret. And there is a quotation, and every Einstein scholar knows this quotation. No one knows where it came from. We don't know if it's apocryphal. But what he says, supposedly, when he hears of the second bomb being dropped, is that I could burn my fingers that I wrote that letter to Roosevelt. So he writes the letter that starts the nuclear age out of fear, but ultimately regrets having done so for pacifistic reasons. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, this is an incredibly beautiful passage, if you'd read the quote that you give that is actually from his 1945 talk. And what's most noted for us to remember is he quotes about uh, Alfred Nobel, and we know how the Nobel Pi Prize got started. Be no, because Albert, he, when he, they made a mistake, Alfred Nobel's brother died. When his brother died, they wrote his obituary. When they re he read his own obituary, which was a mistake, he did not want to be left on this earth, only be known for the most destructive thing. Hence, he used his funds to create the Nobel Prize, which makes this passage even more powerful with that knowledge. Physicists find themselves in a position not unlike that of Alfred Nobel. Alfred Nobel invented the most powerful explosive ever known up to his time, a means of destruction par excellence. In order to atone for this, in order to relieve his human conscience, he instituted his awards for the promotion of peace and for achievements of peace. Today, the physicists who participated in forging the most formidable and dangerous weapon of all times are harassed by an equal feeling of responsibility, not to say guilt. And we cannot desist from warning and warning again. We cannot and should not slacken in our efforts to make the nations of the world and especially their governments aware of the unspeakable disaster they are certain to provoke unless they change their attitude towards each other and toward the task of reshaping the future. We helped in creating this new weapon in order to prevent the enemies of mankind from achieving it ahead of us, which, given the mentality of the Nazis, would have meant inconceivable destruction and the enslavement of the rest of the world. We delivered this weapon into the hands of the American and British people as trustees for the whole of mankind, as fighters for peace and liberty, but so far, we fail to see any guarantee of peace. We do not see any guarantee of the freedoms that were promised to the nations in the Atlantic Charter. The war is won, but the peace is not. That was from a lecture in 1945. And um, it's a beautiful piece, and you do a, a remarkable job. I want to conclude with two questions. One is from our audience. Did Einstein ever concede the possibility of a god? And then, or did his Jewishness remain, quote, secular? The answer is typically Jewish. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> Einstein is asked in a telegram, do you believe in God? And his response was, I believe in the God of Spinoza. Uh, Baruch Spinoza, later Benedictine Spinoza, was a Dutch lens grinder who was also a very important philosopher in the 17th century, and he was a pantheist. That doesn't mean he thinks cookware is divine. What that means is he thinks that God isn't an entity separate from the world. God is the world. There is only one thing in reality, and that is God. And all things are just aspects, modes of God. So there are not separate things. It seems like she's different from him. They're different people. What Spinoza is going to argue is no, there's just one hole in the world. Everything is an aspect of the divine. Now he takes it one step farther, and this is what ultimately gets him excommunicated, which is that logic is immutable that logic runs the universe. The universe is God, which means God's will 
is determined by logic. God is not free. God cannot make up its mind. Now, that did not make anybody happy. But notice the similarity in what we saw in Einstein's own view, right? What we see in Spinoza is that everything is connected, that everything is connected and run by a a logic that lies underneath of it all that's accessible to the human mind. When you look at Spinoza's great work called The Ethics, which isn't actually about ethics most of the time, it's structured exactly like Euclid's Elements. We begin with axioms, then we have theorems, which are proved from it. And so what we see in Spinoza is everything that Einstein loved. And so in Spinoza, Einstein really saw a spiritual partner. He saw somebody else who saw the human mind and its capacity for reason, able to understand the underlying structure of the world. Now, if you have a universe that's governed by immutable laws, well, immutable laws, that seems to mean there is something that put those laws in place, right? A logic, a structure. For him, that's what he means by God. So God for him is not a, an independent entity. There isn't a, what he called a personal God. God for Einstein was the ultimate physics textbook. There is a set of rules by which the universe is governed. That's what he was doing in his, physics, in his physics, which in his sense was a religious activity. He was trying to understand the nature of the universe. And if you see, like Spinoza, the universe as God itself, that's Einstein's cosmic religion or his notion of God. I'm going to, I think that that's great. I'm going to test this out in a little bit and ask you a, a question in a different way. He saw, as you quoted and said, uh, we see the invisible forces, an oxymoron right there, seeing the invisible forces when we look at the compass, Mm -hmm. what was pulling it. So what you're really dealing with when you use that language is is that predicate. You see the result of something, but not actually the something. So I believe we would say today that what ended up happening for Einstein was his Jewishness and his theology were predicate theology. That he dealt and loved and worked. He didn't understand what was the, he believed that there was a force there, but he looked at the result and based on the result, he went backwards and felt and he wanted things to be consistent. So his pacifism is in a sense a predicate theology of his understanding of Jewishness, of the wholeness and the peace and the harmony, and found in the Shema in that sense. And furthermore, his understanding of Zionism and redacting is also to be the result of what nationalism that is necessary for the coming of the Messianic age, which is when there is no nationalism in that sense. So I think that's fair and I think that's insightful. He gives a talk in 1931 called, Is There a Jewish Point of View? And in that, he argues that there are two elements that are sort of at the essence of Judaism. One is a sense of awe and wonder in looking at the universe. And the other is an ethic based on empathy. And I think you're right. I think those two, if we take those as sort of the, the cornerstone of his spiritual view in this larger sense, mm-hmm. right? The sense of awe and wonder when we look at the universe. We see it not just in, say, the Hasidim who look for the mystery, but we see it in the physicist who is looking to understand the nature of the universe itself. And we see in this, you know, uh, an ethic based on empathy, that as I see the suffering of the other as my own suffering. From that, it leads directly to this notion of his pacifism, this problem he has with nationalism and with his larger picture of Zionism. I think you're right. I think it is all certainly well, all contained therein. Well, I want to thank you for, um, first, it's the first time anybody in this congregation has ever said I'm right. And that's, uh, <laughs> and I just want you to know that is, an, is not a covariant, but it, no. Um, uh, But I I think your great gift of this, and this is what's so very important. Um, You know, we we learn from Plato and other things, we talk about the shadows and the 
philosopher king, and we're not sure which we're looking at at certain times. And I think your approach in this, in this opportunity of, first of all, giving us the great insight for those of us who are, who are really neophytes and uh, may have been nerds but didn't have the minds to really understand uh, the physics and the math and all that, your use and your ability uh, as a teacher to explain these complicated uh, theories in such a tangible way is remarkable. Second of all, your gift to us of looking at Einstein and taking, as I mentioned in my office, Einstein apart in the same way you see Einstein taking his theories apart and looking for the proofs is wonderful. And you lead us to the edge, and you're also, uh, as a scientist and as a philosopher, you lead us to the edge and say, I don't have absolute proof, but this is where it takes us. Both of your books are a great gift. Your teaching ability is outstanding. We thank you for giving us this opportunity and for giving me knowing that Einstein still is the greatest, <laughs> and he was even Jewish. So thank you. Thank you. We... <clears throat> outstanding lecture we want to um we want to remind you that books are available out in the lobby i'm going to tell you this is a great read i don't tell you about all the the books i have to read all of these and i'll be honest with you this is a great read and i will tell you if you're more interested and you should definitely find about the ideas of predicate theology it was rabbi schulweiss uh in california who wrote uh it, he's very popular, and he wrote a lot of different things, and he did other things, but he wrote a book on the morality, the question about the morality of evil, in which he comes up with the concept of predicate theology, which is, in, in really goes through and is struggle, struggling with what Buber struggles with, hence what Einstein also, and I believe, as we, if you read more of the speeches of what Einstein is speaking from, really from 39 through 45, 46, 47, or whatever, those speeches and things, you're going to find a tremendous Buberian influence, which is obvious because they spent time together and they spent time in Jerusalem. They both had a vision of Hebrew University, which was ignored, and they both went their separate ways. If only their vision had been put together, we might have a different state of Israel. But thank you.